Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestle Plug. It is time for the State of Wrestling Address, your weekly dose of news and nonsense combined. I am your host, the King of Shit Shithousery, the Egyptian death machine, the proprietor and owner of Wrestle Plug, not to mention the play by play for Coliseum and the videographer for a number of different promotions, as well as referee. I do everything and anything in wrestling. I am, of course, Aaron X. Joining me is the proprietor of Peacehaven. The cream of the crop, one third of bromance, and let's be honest, the brains behind the bromance is, of course, Cameron Cream Anderson. That's right. The president and CEO. Obviously, you're listing your accomplishments, what you can do. I can do a pretty mean wrist lock. Um, and I have to apologize. I'm, I'm not wearing black because, unfortunately, we are, um, you know, remembering a Morning lost the friend lock. today. Yeah, mourning the loss of Aaron Cruz, who uh, <laughs> sadly passed away for a overdose of methamphetamines. Now, of course, I'm going. Um, <laughs> Aaron Cruz, thankfully, is alive and well. We really hope so. Anyway, I haven't spoken to him since he rang me up the other day. Um, yeah, plenty of news. Yeah, get obviously. back to us, Cruz. Yeah, get back. Come back to us. Come <laughs> back to us. Carl Wilkinson, he's dead to us. Uh, is what? <laughs> where the fuck is that guy? Fuck that guy. Uh, yeah, fucking letting down Canada, mate. When Josh Alexander. <laughs> He's going to be furious. So big news, obviously, this week is NXT UK has been shit canned effectively. After a handful of NXT UK stars appeared on NXT 2.0 this week, it has now been revealed that the UK-based brand will be undergoing a revamp slated to take place in 2023. WWE has confirmed that NXT UK will become NXT Europe in 2023. It will continue expanding the current brand that has been active full time since June 2018. Uh, on top of that, we had quite a few uh, people that were basically shit can, so to speak. Uh, people that were released. There's quite a list of wrestlers. Uh, some of the rem- members are include Amelia McKenzie, obviously Millie McKenzie to most of us on the UK scene. Flash Morgan Webster, uh, the French star of Marley, Wild Boar, Mark Andrews, Jack Stars, Dave Mastiff, Ashton Smith, Nina Samuel, Sam Gradwell, Danny Luna, Rohan Raja. Primate, Sean Samuels, Kenny Williams, and the ring announcer, Kirsty Bosley, which is a shame. Very talented woman. Um, the releases of more NXT U star, UK stars are coming to light. Um, there's also, of course, uh, I think, who else was named in this list? You had uh, Eddie Dennis, Amir Jordan, Saxon, Huxley, Taylorman, Trent Seven, Sid Scala, and Zia Brookside. Not to mention, of course, our boy. I know he wasn't on an exclusive contract, but our boy Tate Mayfair is also no longer with the brand. Um is it is it safe to say that this is a bad thing? Because they are saying that the door is also still open. There is an article here, actually, where Triple H says that the door is open for released NXT UK talent to return to WWE. That's the long and short of it. So i got to think that when NXT Europe opens its doors, the majority of these people are going to come back. So, um, yeah, you okay with a rebrand for now? Yeah, so obviously I heard the news. I'm devastated for everyone. But to be fair, from what I've seen, everyone seems to be, um, you know, in high spirits. I think they all know this isn't really the end of the road. Um, So I imagine a lot of these names, there's a lot of high profile people. Trent Seven in particular, I imagine is going to be back once NXT Europe starts up. Um, It is sad because I feel like the product was really good. It just wasn't really given a fair crack. And it's like lockdown kind of killed a lot of momentum like a, I don't know. I feel like with the world's collide event just before the first lockdown, they were really starting to build momentum. So mm. it is a shame, but hopefully, well, this isn't the end. So it's a shame because a lot of the people we know or have worked with or have watched growing up, um, obviously, I'm lucky enough to have worked with a few of these guys, recorded them, done promo shots, whatever it might be, and. Uh, but a, a weird, selfish way, I'm kind of excited. I mentioned this earlier, where we work so prominently, especially myself on the indie scene, it's actually really exciting. There's the potential for quite a few of these people to come through our doors, you know, whether it be a rumble or, a, you know, a, whatever, whatever it might be, whatever company, premier promotions, for instance, like the ones that you work for, there's a good opportunity here. You might actually end up picking up a very nice residual here. Someone who's quite young and early in their career, like yourself, could end up working a Sean Samuels, could end up working a Danny Luna even in an intergender contest or whatever it might be. There's a lot of potential there. And obviously, Flash Morgan Webster and Wild Boar bring so much experience. And a lot of these people were indie talents, indie darlings before they went there. They're not WWE products. So they can just slide straight into a show. You know, you don't even have to hesitate. Oh, 
Trent Seven, wham, straight back in. You know guys like that are probably going to want to apply their trade and test themselves against the big stars that our indie scene has to offer. And then they can bring them with them for NXT Europe. So it might, in a roundabout kind of way, work out really well for them. And I think a rebranding is good because I like NXT UK. I thought the quality of wrestling was the best of any of WWE's products. But, like you say, nobody cared. Uh, lockdown and speaking out were massive, massive issues for that brand as well. We lost a lot of talent, rightfully so, because of their shitty behaviour. Uh, so, yeah, no, I... It's one of those things where normally I'd be a bit disappointed, but I think there's a massive amount of silver linings to this. And I think that overall, actually, in about a year or so's time, we're probably going to look back and say this actually worked out really well for them, especially if Europe, when it's rebranded, works as well as it does. So, uh, yeah, Cameron Anderson and Aaron Nix, primed and ready to work for NXT Europe. Triple H, give me the call, son. Oh, yes. Will we see the European title back? To be honest, if it's NXT Europe, you've got to have the European Championship. I think it would yeah, be very right, smart. Actually. I think you should make the UK title like their IC title <clears throat> and then rebrand or you know bring back the European title as the NXT European title. I think that would be fucking sick. Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm that's hoping um, they don't unify the uh, UK title because it's, it's so lovely just to have, uh, you know, for the country, uh, to have our own title represented in there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the design is so beautiful. Yeah, it's just nice. It's got a lot of prestige it's... already, hasn't it? Like, if you look at yeah. the of who's held it, Tyler Bay, uh, Volta, Ilya Dragunov, like, these are, you know, these are high-quality, world-class wrestlers. And also, everyone who held it, it meant something, you know? Like, a lot of these title runs, you think, yeah, okay, whatever, like... You know, sadly, I don't think many of us are going to remember Bobby Lashley's fabled second WWE title on much, are we? Like, whereas, you know, I'm always going to remember the fact that Pete Dunne was champion for so long. That was fucking amazing. The way that Volta bit slapped him and took the belt. And then Ilya Dragunov versus Volta giving me the world's largest stiffy. Like, come on. Um, yeah, literally. You know. Like, um, there's so many memories involved there. Like, even uh, Pete Dunne, Tyler Bate when Pete Dunne first won the belt, like we were all talking about that in school the next day, like when they first announced the belt, like all of my friends were just like all the wrestling pack pretty much just like, yeah, we want that. Like, I don't know. I, I do hope they keep it. I hope there's not a title unification. Yeah. There's some nice memories with WrestlePlug as well. Like me and Fraz, when we first started doing a podcast years ago, um, we went to the NXT UK tapings where they, you know, crowned the number one contender to face where basically Pete Dunne uh, became number one contender to face Tyler Bate. And then they had that amazing, I think it was NXT Chicago, like the takeover there. Mm. Fucking ridiculous. Nice. Stole it. Still an all-time great matchup. So, yeah, the um the quality could not be denied. It's just, unfortunately, the programming didn't match up to the lineage of what the belt was doing. So, hopefully, the rebrand will help. And also, it'll be a chance to bring in some more exciting, you know, we could see different, like, like Spain, for instance, doesn't really feel like it's got much going on. I know we've had a kid come in. He's fucking amazing. But there's so many more in Spain. You know, my friends, Yoara and Mikhail, who work out there, you know, they're really talented wrestlers. This might open the door for them to work, which would be so sick. So fingers crossed, it's going to actually, in a roundabout way, bring things back and hopefully things are going to be better for it. Uh, something that probably isn't going to be better for it is Vince McMahon, who just will not stay out of the news ever. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported last week that former WWE chairman and CEO Vince McMahon made improper payments totaling $5 million to the Donald J. Trump Foundation, founded by Donald Trump, get out of here, with separate transactions being made in 2007 for $4 million and in 2009 for $1 million. The $5 million amount was initially revealed in WWE's SEC filing on August the 9th. The WSJ, who've covered McMahon's misconduct since June, have now provided further insight into the payments made to the now defunct foundation. They revealed the $4 million payment sent by McMahon in 2007 represented 98% of all contributions to the foundation that year. So basically in that year, 98% of the money that they made in contributions was from Vince McMahon. The second payment of a million dollars sent by McMahon in 2009 accounted for 91% of the foundation's received payments that year. So obviously Trump 
even back then, not so popular. It is also understood that Trump directed his WWE appearance fees to the foundation, which is not necessarily a bad thing, to be fair. Uh, Trump's most notable WWE appearance came in 2007, the same year that the $4 million payment was sent over to the foundation at WrestleMania 23 in the Battle of the Billionaires match. It doesn't sound like um, a massive deal, but obviously when you factor in that we've also got this ongoing investigation, uh, WWE themselves investigating that, you know, Vince McMahon has paid millions in terms of hush money. We've got allegations as well. Um, even though people feel like they're turning a corner with Triple H being on creative and the TV product is getting better slowly but surely, is this still overall too much damage for WWE and does it hurt them long term? I don't think it hurts them long term if we're being realistic. Um, obviously, it's bad. I'm not saying it's not bad, but I really do think this is just going to be something that people will forget after a while uh unfortunately um i don't really know what this foundation is about um so i'm, I'm not really going to comment on really that uh but it does feel like more and more skeletons are coming out for vince and it is a shame because you want to kind of look back on the memories like vince has this aura you want to look back on the memories and enjoy them and it's the same with a lot of the people who've been cancelled over the years who have like i say cancelled but it's like rightfully we've removed them um, and, you know, you want to enjoy the memories, but you just can't really, to be honest. Um, and it is a shame. It just feels like next week we're going to be on the State of Wrestling Address saying that um, Vince's ticket on Jeff Epstein's plane has come out, something like that. That's, I wouldn't put it past him. Um, I thought I'd quickly have a look. The Donald J. Trump Foundation was a New York-based tax-exempt private foundation formed in 1988 by Donald Trump and existed until its court ordered dissolution in 2019. It was formed by Trump to receive his share of the royalties from his book, Trump, The Art of the the Art of the Deal, as well as donations from outsiders to be applied to charitable causes. But then apparently it was dissolved because he was removing funds from it to help boost his presidential candidacy in 2016. So basically he was like, yo, ah. give me to charity, then using it to fund. Yeah, like, not a good look. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh... It's a very bad look. So when Vince is the guy who's put the majority of that money in over to what basically what we're saying is Vince McMahon is essentially saying, oh, yeah, I'll give money to your charity. But let's be real. Chances are he was saying, take it out on the download. This is a way of getting away around taxes. And obviously the IRS, not just Irvin R. Shyster himself, are going to be pretty pissed about that. <laughs> I know. I know a little something about taxes. Uh, so, um. Here we are. Um, bottom line is, yeah, don't fuck with IRS if you are a billionaire because, uh, yeah, they've got more to fucking aim for. It's as simple as that. So more obvious Vince McMahon nonsense. Um, would you be willing to donate any money to the George Whittle Foundation? Should it be available at some point? <laughs> the George Whittle Foundation. If anyone needs a charity, it's that boy. No, I'm not donating a single penny to him. None of my Saudi Arabia money is going to George. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> basically, fuck you, George. Uh, speaking of things that might break George's heart even more, did you hear about Bron, ba Bron, ba Bron, Bron Baker? Yeah, that's his name. Um, Mary Berry Psychic. Bron Baker appears to have more invested in NXT than just being the brand's champion. Breaker recently shared a photo on Instagram with him and fellow NXT star Cora Jade posing closely together. Uh, implying that they might be in a relationship. Uh, are we, uh, what do we, I don't personally give a shit, but it's on the news docket, so we might as well talk about it because it might bring a bit of a giggle. Bron Breaker is apparently banging Cora Jade, yay or nay? I just want to say, good job, Bron Breaker. Really happy for you guys. Oh, man. Um, yeah, bless up. Yeah, yo, yo, game recognized game. Well done, son. Well done. Like, I, I, yo, <laughs> fucking seriously, mathematics that puss, fam. That's all I've got to say on the man. <laughs> I, I really want him to cut a promo while banging it. I really do. Uh, <laughs> proper going full with Steiner. <laughs> So yeah. guys, NXT Tuesday next week. Tune in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out the heat wave is next week, not this week. Um, speaking of uh, NXT quite, quite quickly, uh, unfortunately, probably the most exciting element of the women's uh, tag team tournament that's going on in WWE has been removed. Apparently tonight's edition of WWE SmackDown, we'll film this on a Friday, um, is going to be more toxic than originally planned. Uh, now confirmed by WWE, neither Zoe Starks nor her tag partner Nikita Lyons are medically cleared to compete in the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship Tournament. 
Uh, Stark suffered an injury, apparently, at this past Tuesday's Heat Wave event in a losing effort against the NXT Women's Champion Mandy Rose. Or, uh, Lions' medical issue is still undisclosed. So, apparently, the NXT Women's Tag Team Champions will replace them in JC Jane and Gigi Dolin of Toxic Attraction. Oh, yeah. Uh, how, uh, perfectly good replacements? More than acceptable? Who are they facing? Uh, I don't know if I'm being honest because I, I swear they're that. against Natalia and someone. Oh, I swear gross. they're they're against Natalia and Sonia Deville. I think. I think yeah. so. Please win, Toxic yeah. Attraction. I beg. Oh, um, I... obviously that sucks for Zoe Stark. So I swear she just come back, ain't she? That is awful. Uh, hopefully it's um not gonna put her on the shelf for too long. No, hopefully it's a short-term deal. And obviously Nikita Lyons feels like she could be like the next big, big thing that WWE has, not just because she is peng as fuck, but she's also insanely talented, amazing combatist, amazing wrestler, uh, just everything. People everything just love her. Want. People really do love her. Yeah, they do. She's already red hot on social media, much more so than anyone else in NXT. So, yeah, it's disappointing. It is for Zoe Stark. Um Nikita Lyons will be fine when she comes back. You know, she's obviously, I think they've got more of an idea of her being a single star anyway. Wouldn't surprise me if she's ready to go soon that she knocks off Mandy Rose. She strikes me as maybe the next one to do it. I would personally be happy to wait even longer and just slow build her. But, you know, as long as she's on TV, I could care less. Um, I love Toxic Attraction. I think they're amazing. I think they're actually a re- they're probably the perfect replacement. I think, thinking about it, they're the only women's tag team that is legitimately a tag team that is available that isn't already in this or going for it. So that's perfect. And, you know, there are rumours abound that maybe Sasha Banks and Naomi will beat up the winners and that will be added to it just because they never lost their belts and there were streets of them. What do we think about uh, Sasha Banks and Naomi being at the, I think it was the She-Hulk premiere, wasn't it? Oh, I did see that, yeah. Um, You know, it's nice to see them um, you know, try and prove, well, I'm not going to say try because that's kind of a negative connotation there. But, you know, they're obviously doing their own thing without WWE. They're going to prove, you know, that they are massive stars. So, you know, yeah. that's good. To, it's good to see them at like a mainstream event like that. I did watch the first episode of She-Hulk. It is pretty jokes. Is it? Okay, I'll give it a watch. I'll tell you what, I'll watch it tonight when everyone goes to bed. And I'll, I shall relay the information next week and we'll have a good natter about the She-Hulk attorney at law, I think it's called. Um, yeah 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 should be a laugh i mean the woman i got to play her is a very good actress from what i can tell she's also very beautiful so and also the actual hulk is in it isn't he the guy who plays um yeah hulk. bruce bruce banner's in it i think they've done it in quite a it's very comedic but i think they've done it in a really good way so yeah and um you gotta make sure you watch the uh mid credit scene as well i saw martin Rowe post something about that but obviously we don't take martin Rowe very seriously on this podcast yeah. so um yeah, fuck that guy. It no. is unreal. It is one of the greatest moments in the history of the uh, Marvel Universe. I know you're not a massive fan, but you will enjoy Thanos this. rock so. up halfway through and start beating the shit out of she <laughs> No, it's so, uh, Thanos and uh, Hulk are at the urinals, yeah. and then Hulk just looks down and laughs and walks off. <laughs> Thanos is like, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Yo, that's that's the content people came to this podcast to listen to, not this wrestling. <laughs> like, we'll get to Marvel soon, ladies and gentlemen, because obviously at the end of things, we always like to have a little now. Um, there's not much else, honestly, I want to talk about, other than apparently the fact that fucking CM Punk has gone bananas. Um, oh, he's yeah. reported. So there's all kinds of reports here, all kinds of different news stories. Uh, so on Dynamite this week, it started with a bang when CM Punk called out AEW interim world champion John Moxley, Hangman Page, and Eddie Kingston. Since the show aired, it's been reported that Punk went off script when he called out Page for a rematch from their bout earlier this year, knowing prior that the former champion wouldn't appear to accept his challenge. After defeating Page at Double or Nothing in May, Punk was forced to sit on the sidelines for several months, nursing a foot injury. Uh, according to a recent report from Fight for Select, Punk met with AEW higher-ups about the context of one of Page's promos, telling others after the meeting that he wouldn't lose to Page at the pay-per-view. The report also states that people within AEW felt that last night's promo was unfair to Page, given that he wasn't aware it was going to happen, therefore not giving him an opportunity to respond in kind, uh, putting him in a no-win situation. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Punk felt his promo was a receipt to Hangman Page for previous comments, a- Fightful also mentioned that Page was in the building last night, but hadn't received any word on how he responded to the promo. 
Uh, apparently, the confrontational individual uh, that is CM Punk is fairly well received, but so is Hangman Page backstage, and people were a little bit disappointed that he was treated that way. This is all kind of stemming from allegedly, we have to say, it could all be a fucking work. It does sound like it, to be honest. But um, apparently this stems from Hangman Page essentially going on his Twitter and saying that he doesn't need to take advice from a load of the veterans because he's good enough. Just for fine. Like, that's his, yeah. his preference. Like I don't personally have an issue with it. Uh, Eddie Kingston certainly had no problem giving it back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you heard Eddie Kingston's words. Um. Yeah, so uh, when Punk insulted Kingston during the opening moments of AEW, Punk claimed Kingston was the third best Eddie he'd been in a ring with behind Eddie Guerrero and fast Eddie Vegas, and the second best Kingston he had shared a locker room with behind Punk's former tag partner, Kofi Kingston. It will shock no one to know that Kingston didn't take Punk's comments lying down when he tweeted, of course the cunt says shit when I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fabulous. I love Eddie That's Kingston great. so much. Uh, yeah, apparently um, loads of stuff going on, but we won't really dwell on it because it's all just fucking here saying stuff. Uh, CM Punk basically being a super toxic and super edgy character or not. Yeah, or nay. You okay with it? Not bothered? Whatever. I'd, I'm kind of in, um, I don't know. I don't know because I think it could be a work. I do. I'm, I'm going to throw out this conspiracy theory that it's a work just because they've already started the work shoot stuff with MJF and they've already had Eddie Kingston in the past go off at CM Punk for, you know, being selfish um, and, you know, like always looking out for himself. I think this could be maybe a way to slowly turn Punk heel. Yeah, that's what it feels and like. It's, and the thing is, it's like this could be kind of a new this could be like a sort of new um, era in wrestling in a way where because people know it's fake, then they're just going to double dip. It's like the matrix inside the matrix where like you think you're an insider, yeah. but really they've got you twice. Still part of the system. Yeah. Yeah. You're all part of the working mechanism. that is the matrix. Yeah. It does feel that way. And to be fair, the one thing I would never deny about punk is his excellent mic skills. One of the better ones. Uh, he can talk, he can trash talk, he can do anything. You know, that's CM Punk in a nutshell. For me... I think Mox washed him. Yeah, I haven't seen personally um, what was said. Anything particularly juicy? Or is this all I building just, up just... to their title match? I don't know. I feel like Punk made a few points where I'm just like, it's not really a, that's not really a flex. Um, and I just feel like Mox had a better energy. Um, like, I think if this is a work... Mox is going to probably be the biggest baby face in the company, maybe in wrestling, who knows? Um, just because the way Mox was, he presented himself so well, like a fighter, like a proper champ. Um, and I feel like Punk didn't really portray himself that way. And then when he squared up to Punk and like knocked into him, I'm just like, yeah, I'm ready to see this fight. And I don't really watch AEW regularly. So they sold me. They sold me. <laughs> Yeah, I, you... I've got to be honest, AEW looks okay at the moment. I'm not watching it personally, but I have promised that I will watch next week's Dynamite because apparently United Empire are facing Death Triangle and I'm not missing that for Oh, love. yeah. Money. That is have money. You, um, I will watch that. Have you seen the uh, Stone Cold Sessions with uh, Sami Zayn? No. So there's a story Sami Zayn tells where him and Neville were cutting a promo on each other in NXT when they're about to face off. And uh, Undertaker's backstage and he turns around to everyone. And he's like really hyped up. He just goes, yeah, these guys just sold some tickets. And I felt that's how I feel about the uh, Punk Mox feud. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, if Undertaker's behind you, who the fuck are we to argue? That's pretty cool, to be honest. Yeah, no, I am. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I, I can imagine me five years ago. Oh, sure. I'm seeing Punk. If Carl Wilkinson was here, he'd probably be spitting rage. About how much um, he hates CM Punk and all that, but yeah, that's because he's a mark. Yeah, yes, he is, and he's not. Yeah. He's not twelve matrixes deep in the wrestling landscape like I am. That is very true. So, a couple more stories before we start chatting shit, as we always do. Nice short one for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Goldberg news. <laughs> I uh, know, right? So after Goldberg finally signed with WWE in 2003, many fans were clamoring for fresh matchups that involved the former WCW champion. While viewers were able to see some of those, including The Rock, the one that never happened was, of course, his alter ego, 
during the Attitude Era that was Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh, Goldberg was recently on Talk Is Jericho. I might actually give that a listen, although I doubt it was as good as Stone Cold Sessions. Uh, There's no question I wish it would have happened, said Goldberg. That was the match to have. Why it never happened, I think 90% of the reason behind that was Austin's neck issues and my finishing moves. Whether it be the spear, whether it be the jackhammer, I don't think that those are moves that he would have wanted to wanted to do, nor would his boss would have wanted him to do. I think it was a safety issue more so than anything. So are we disappointed that we never got Goldberg versus Stone Cold Steve Austin? I'm going to be honest. Obviously, I am the resident Goldberg fanatic. I f- I feel like their styles would mesh in some ways and it wouldn't in others. Um, but again, if we're thinking, you know, like the Goldberg return when he was having the shorter matches, yeah. um, you know, against like Brock Lesnar, then I think this could be really effective. It could still happen. We've seen, we've seen uh, Stone Cold get back in there. So... Who knows? Saudi Arabia, let's go. Clash at the Castle. Yo, give me what I want. Clash at the Castle um... is, by the way, two weeks away. And I don't even know how we're getting there yet. (laughs) I've got no no plans, no accommodation, nothing. I'm just going to... I'm going to cold play tomorrow and I've got no idea. Yeah, no, I'm just going to play it by ear, get ACW out of the way next week and we'll see how things go from there. Um, yeah, no, I, I must admit, I would have liked to have seen it maybe in the mid 90s or late 90s when they both were actually really like good and good to go. But yeah, no, they with an injured Austin and with Goldberg aging and not doing particularly well in that original WWE run until obviously, you know, his son got the shit kicked out of him by Bobby Lashley. That's where the real money's That's at, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so we're all about seeing. Young men getting beaten the shit out of Bob Bobby Lashley. <laughs> that's that's what yeah. we want. That's where Bobby the Bobby Lashley man. versus Bromance. Not being funny, but let's be honest, mate. If fucking Loganberg had fucking debuted at WrestleMania and main eventing against Kevin Owens, that would have made a lot more money. Just saying. <laughs> um, it is what it is. Um, so, speaking of, speaking of Loganberg, how is your brand new Bromance member Victor Logan settling in? Oh, well, I'm happy to have him aboard. I'm a, I feel like he was very, very, very impressive at CWP when we linked up for the first time. Crowd was receptive. They were loving us. And I have to say, I think it was very successful. Um, you know, we did really turn that one around after obviously Cruz went down with an injury. And he has been offered a full time contract with Bromance Entertainment Industries. <laughs> out the bromance condo is ready to go. It's going to be many a sun lounger and many a hoe running around that facility. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. oh my yes. lord! Yeah, fuck boyery is about to explode. It really is. Uh, I have to say, Victor Logan, great pickup for the bromance. Great talent, powerhouse as well. Brings that much needed bit of velocity and smash mouth nature to what you guys do as well as keeping with the spirit of what bromance really is so yeah aaron cruz gotta step up your game mate otherwise you're yeah man I, I had um i had girls messaging me after the match saying like who's this hairy guy you're teaming with so obviously yeah cruz needs to pull yeah. the thumb out i was gonna say I, I hear the ballard is ferociously excited <laughs> about this one fam so you know. yeah <laughs> Yeah. I actually did go to um a house party and someone was chatting to me about it <laughs> the match. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, like one of the girls there had actually watched it, and um, I think she was mentioning like when I did the uh, bridge and yeah. caught up um, Danny Disorder. That was sexy. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was a good match. It was a good match. I finally got around to watching it properly after yes! it, did it, and uh, it was an excellent contest. Um, yeah, Cameron Anderson, so again, taking a little bit too much of a shit kicking for my liking, but you know, at the end of the day, you got to fucking give the fans what they want and they want to see you in a vulnerable position. Any truth to the rumors that you might potentially be the cover photo for certain individuals that have no relation to you whatsoever? Um, I can't, I can't comment on this. I just got to say, you know, if my fans want to use photos of me, then by all means, go for it. Yeah, I mean, you want, I'll out. tell you what. The Ballard needs to take a screenshot right now because she's getting a little sneak peek at the goods, hon. Absolutely. I love how you repose. Just, just a little bit more leg. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Honestly, I bet she's a vampire. 
let's get down to business. It's looking uh, chunky, though, isn't it? On the... You are looking quite flexed, I have to say. Quite impressive. So, yeah, no, um, Bromance looking good. CWP looking good. Of course, obviously, CWP has announced Pumpkins and Pile Drivers, which takes place October the 22nd. And do you know what? You're going to find out anyway. So you may as well find out now. Bromance, number one contenders, as we already know, will get their tag team championship shot. The big one takes place. Oasis Academy, Lord's Hill, of course, in Southampton, October 22nd. Doors open at 4 o'clock. First bell, a prompt for 30. £10 for adults, £5 for other 16s. And you will get to see two of the three members of Bromance. We don't know who yet. Of course, that is a executive decision to be made closer to the day. And they will, of course, face the reigning tag team champions that are Good Goff Almighty's Frankie T and the Goff Daddy Zander. Is it time for Bromance to bring home the gold? Oh, I see. It is uh, overtime at this point. You know what? I was really disappointed when we didn't get our tag title shot initially, but mm. I think now we've got Logan in the firm. I think it's firm, just going to get say. better and better. Yeah. But now oh. we've got Logan involved. I just think we've had an opportunity to double our strengths and triple yeah. our abilities. So we're going to smash these golf boys up. You know, they lost to uh, Simon Durden. That's embarrassing. That is a bit embarrassing. <laughs> Frankie T taking the L to Roger Sears, but most importantly, Simon Durden, who picks up the win in a triple threat match. Um, yeah, you must be feeling confident knowing that Frankie T literally just lost to the most boring wrestler on mankind. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling confident. <laughs> yeah, be good. And of course, there will be a full pre show, no doubt. Just well, we won't do a pre show because I just can't be asked because there's too many scrubs on that car. But of course, the proper professional wrestlers that are the bromance will get the proper rub as they always do, ladies and gentlemen. So it is what it is. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, one more, one more new story before we get out of Dodge. Storylines wrestlers seriously regret doing. This will be a laugh. Many wrestlers do what they think is best for their careers, whether that's pitching storylines they think could propel them to the main event at WrestleMania or whether it's a whole new character direction to refresh their gimmicks. So what we have here, there have been many storylines that wrestlers are less than proud of, whether that is because the crowd didn't go for it in the moment, whether it's because the idea wasn't really thought through well, or whether it was something else entirely. There are a multitude of reasons how something can bring about a certain amount of regrets. <laughs> and no doubt me and Cameron probably by the end of it will have many regrets of our own. Uh, some of these regrets... Oh, mate, I've already got dirty 24-7, baby. So, yeah, here are storylines that allegedly uh, were basically regretted by the individuals involved. I want you to give me a quick little burst of energy, Cameron, and answer for each one and tell me whether you think they should regret them or whether they were actually underrated bangers. So, Cody Rhodes... Cody Rhodes? Co Cody Rhodes, excuse me, it's very late. Cody Rhodes solves racism. In the build-up to the Double or Nothing 2021 pay-per-view, Cody Rhodes started a feud with Anthony Gogo, our very own. Uh, in a bizarre creative direction, this was built as a clash of nations between USA and the UK, uh, with Rhodes using the feud to become the American dream, like his father. In doing so, Cody Rhodes cut a heartfelt promo on Dynamite. Speaking of patriotic view of America, uh, the promo was panned by fans and critics alike, with many calling it tone deaf and advised. Uh, what do we think about that? I sh I'm sure you remember that hilarious moment in AEW. Oh, yes. Well, first of all, obviously, UK versus USA. Um, whenever it comes down to like a feud where it's the UK versus another country, I, I'm in my head. I'm like, you know, I know British Empire was evil. I know we have committed atrocities. But every single time it comes up to UK and not against another country, I'm just like, come on, UK, let's do it. So I was fully refined. Um, Anthony Agogo for this yeah. one. Um, so I am an admitted Cody Rhodes flip flopper because I hated him in this feud so much and I adore him now. Yeah, he's amazing. I man. believe he's the savior of wrestling now. Yeah. But with this feud, I hated him so much. I thought it was the cringiest thing I've ever seen. So I will have to put that on the regrets, I'm afraid. 
All right, that's fair enough. Uh, I luckily didn't watch much of it. What I did see of it was fucking pure garbage. Uh, Shawn Michaels coming out of retirement to wrestle in Saudi Arabia at Crown Jewel 2018. It was announced that Shawn Michaels would indeed come out of retirement, teaming with Triple H to take on the Brothers of Destruction in the retirement home. Uh, in a Zoom interview with the New York Post, Shawn Michaels was asked if he regretted coming out of retirement for that match. He said, I do. I had no idea that that, from Mark's standpoint, he was looking at it as that might be the one he could walk away on. So Undertaker basically had pitched during the last Ride documentary that he felt that that was hopefully going to be his last match uh, against, you know, DX, who had come out of uh, retirement, so to speak. Um, he said, that's something that I think to myself now, oh my goodness, I wish that I'd have known that because then I would not have done it. <laughs> so... Shawn Michaels and Triple H versus Kane and The Undertaker at Crown Jewel 2018. Uh, I thought it was fucking atrocious. What do you think? Um, I think we'll put this one on regrets as well. I have to say this might be controversial. How, how deep are we into this? How long have we been going for? Not even an hour, I don't think. Oh, shit. Okay, people might actually see this controversial take. But I think at this point, if we want our wrestlers to have the perfect send-offs, we just got to euthanize them after they have five-star classics. Oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know what? It's controversial, but it doesn't go without being slightly factual. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not... Look, okay, wrestle plug, we're not about euthanasia, but if we were going to make an exception, this does seem like a good idea, to be honest. Some people really should. Or just fucking force them to retire. No, you've had a five-star. Out. Get out. Yep. You're Sorry, not Sean. See you later. <laughs> Sorry, Sean, but the ultimate train is a coming. Um, it's time to take old Yeller out back. You've had your five star. <laughs> maybe, maybe as punishment to Meltzer, constantly handing out five stars, he has to be the one that euthanizes all these wrestlers once they have one. So every time Kenny Omega has, a, so next time he's like seven stars. Right, that's it, Kenny Omega in the basket. Off you go. <clears throat> You imagine, like, after WrestleMania, you just, like, had an amazing match. You're just sitting there like, oh, shit, oh, I'm going to go backstage and just be killed. <laughs> Meltzer standing there with a shotgun. It's time. You're like, no! <laughs> Trying to outrun the Meltzer. Mate, Meltzer is literally like the Guardians at the end of fucking season three of Umbrella Academy. Like, he, he he's coming for you. He is. But that doesn't mean that he is completely undefeatable. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> check it out. It's good shit. We'll talk about it in a minute. All right. Uh, Lita Edge and Matt Hardy's love triangle. Not really much else that needs to be added there. Obviously, it was apparently a real life drama where Matt Hardy's partner, Lita, had cheated on him with Edge. And then this, of course, was made into a full on storyline. Speaking on the podcast Oral Sessions with Renee Paquette, which is arguably the worst name podcast you could do when we're talking about what we're talking about here. Um, Lita said, I'll tell you, it was not easy. I almost quit a month into the whole love triangle. At that point, not only was it so hard, phrasing, it was also out of shame. I was just like, I deserve all these terrible things that everybody is saying to me. I deserve not wanting to wake up every morning. That's really depressing. It was also difficult as time passed to let myself off the hook. I felt very alone and isolated and just in a really bad place. Um, yeah, your name to the storyline being used in real life. All right. Obviously, what you just said has maybe gone, okay, maybe it's bad. But I think for iconic moments, it was good. It was, it was good, really cool. Obviously, Matt did look a bit like a massive cuck boy, but I think Is that why that's going to be remembered out? forever. Banging so... the arse off a of Rebbe. Like, <laughs> he's like, yo, I'm repopulating the earth as punishment. That's true. He did bounce back. So, yeah, I'd say dub. Yeah, big dub. Do you know what? Actually, it was quite good from a storyline perspective, because it was so real, it was one of those, because by that point, we'd gotten over the whole, oh, is it real, is it not thing? And this blurred the lines back up a little bit and made us more invested in what's real and what's not. And then we we even had, like, famous little lines, like, you know, Paul Heyman saying, Matt freaking Hardy to Edge at One Night Stand. It, it actually had a lot of great content, and the matches were really good as well. That's what people don't remember, is the matches between Edge and... Um, Matt Hardy were actually really fucking good there. Ladder match where Lita came out looking redonkulous. And also, I thought it made Lita tenfold hotter as a heel. Like, you just thought, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Now that I know that you've done the dutty, like, I want you to do the dutty on me now. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's one of those, like, obviously. Very excited. Yeah, you shouldn't have to be, like, put in that mental state. Like, it's really, like, I know people oh, say, like, oh, well, Larry's, Larry Zavisco got stabbed in the ass, But, like, you know, I, I don't think you should be doing things if it's going to take that much of a mental toll. Um, but obviously, we live in the future now. We know that, you know, it's been and done. So I'd say well, I'm giving it an up. 
We're going back to Saudi. It's getting an up from me, by the way. Shout out to Simon Miller. By the way, I'll share the locker room with really cool, actually. He's so cool, isn't he? Love that guy a lot. A lot of time, Simon Miller. What culture is not really my thing, but fair play to you, mate. You've earned your success. And by the way, you're an absolute joy to work with in a locker room. Really cool. His his videos on his personal channel are pretty fantastic. So That's where I probably will start checking him out, because yeah. I actually like Simon Miller, you know, the human being, a lot more than the personality. The celebrity yeah. you know? um really really but he's awful. he gives um like really good informational video on going to the gym and that so yeah i mean look at him. what a machine yeah. like tell you what it, when you're in front of him you realize just how impressive he looks oh my god yeah he's huge because i met him once at training obviously like i'm just a nobody he gave me a lot of time was chatting to me about stuff gave jack shepherd a um hip toss and sent him flying which is pretty incredible um i think i gave Dude. him a hip toss and all um pretty cool but yeah so i think with his youtube stuff i have to say like um a lot of his gym focus things he doesn't really make a profit he's not like plugging his own stuff so yeah. that's why i feel like he's uh you know, i really appreciate Sal Mo's, like a lot of people who work with me probably think i can be a bit of an arsehole at times but you have to be kind of ruthless in that mode to make your money you know we're independent artists and that's how we make our money so yeah no i understand it and um yeah very very pleasant guy and also really good, like really talented, deserves a lot of credit because you would be, you would be kind of forgiven for thinking, here he goes, you know, here he goes, another celebrity. But just like Logan Paul, he is on it, mate. Like he is on it and he works well and he takes our business so seriously. And I have nothing but love and respect for Simon Miller for taking the business seriously. Speaking of not taking the business seriously, let's move on to the next one. Undertaker's match with Goldberg from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, your name. Undertaker I'm gonna have to give this. Regret. Yeah, I know Undertaker regrets it. Um, I'm gonna have to give this one a a bad regret. Um, I love God. I love both these guys. Uh, unfortunately, just didn't click on the night. Um, but hopefully we'll get it. Um, in the future, one day. Yeah, it was garbage. It was boys. I'm sorry. <laughs> um... All right, let's ramp it up a little bit. Once in a lifetime, John Cena versus The Rock. John Cena says that he regrets some of the things that were said between the two parties as they actually have a lot of love and respect for each other um, and ultimately regrets the concept that it happened more than once in the end. Uh, John Cena versus The Rock. Once in a lifetime from WrestleMania 28. Yay or nay? All right, so obviously I said earlier, like CM Punk, he's kind of got this ego about him. But I do agree it should have been a triple threat at WrestleMania 29. Um, I think overall, I'm not going to say regret that we got the Rock Cena feud because that is kind of, um, you know, that's kind of legendary that we got to see that. And it, it feels massive. Like, I feel like if you took someone off the street, doesn't know wrestling, you just went, oh, yeah, Rock Cena. They're like, yeah, that's the biggest match of all time. Um, Obviously, I think I think I've seen posts where he's like regretting what he said in terms of like being a part timer because, of course, that is what he would later become. Yeah, irony. but yeah, I but I think obviously in that moment you're doing that storyline, the ammo's there. Use it. It doesn't really matter that much. I don't think. I thought it was a great build. I thought the match was terrible, um, and it wasn't bad. Like I thought the second one was much worse. To be fair. Um, but and obviously, I think The Rock like tore his groin or something. Oh, or yeah, it, he he got yeah. injured early, yeah, he'd done his hernia or something crazy, and it was like, well, he was fucked from that point onwards. So, you know, I think like for him to just finish alone was pretty impressive. Um, yeah, no, it was good for business. So, you know, and as you know, I'm all about good for business, even if it upsets people. So, that is what it is. Hulk Hogan's yeah. last match in TNA. Uh, Hulk Hogan regrets it, apparently. His match against Sting at Bound for Glory 2011, which actually, ironically enough, was quite well received. Hogan turns face at the end, which was a great moment. The crowd it really popped for it. Um, you know, considering how shit Hogan was, particularly in the latter days, it actually wasn't that bad. Um, but Hogan regrets it. Uh, have you seen it? Do you give a shit? I, I have not, but I know that Hogan actually retired in a house show in UK. So... If you if you have a look, I swear his last match is like in Manchester or Liverpool or Newcastle, something like that. Really? Yeah, it's like um, yeah, it's just like in England. Um, I think it's because so he has to DNA, doesn't he? Like in, the, in in this line, he said, "I talked to Vince and I said I really don't know if I could live for myself knowing my last match was with DNA. <laughs> if I can get fixed, I pray I can have one more match." And that was in 2019. Really? I I don't know. I don't think because I know I just said about euthanizing someone after they had a five star match. 
But I do kind of like the idea of, you know, just going until eventually you just can't go anymore. And it's like, you know, it can happen at any time. I think Triple H, now that he can't wrestle, is, um, you know, like the perfect example of that, where he was just kind of going, he was having these like sort of spotlight matches. And then all of a sudden it's just, it's just gone like that. And I, I don't know, I feel like this, there's something cool about that in a way. Yeah, believe it or not, I haven't seen it actually, despite all the stuff that I've consumed over the years. Um, you know what? Whatever is what it is. Uh, I don't care. Don't like Hulk Hogan. Think he's a piece of shit. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. I, th- I right. think I don't think anyone. I don't think everyone necessarily has to have the massive WrestleMania send off. No, no. I think Ric Flair kind of ruined it for everyone else by having the perfect retirement match, and then ruined yeah. it for himself several fucking times because he quite literally just had his last match. And that was 14 years later. Yeah, he uh, he's wrestled uh, more recently than I have. <laughs> yeah. <that's me. laughs> that's the I've wrestled this year. Fuck's sake. Fuck um, you. <laughs> so, and, yeah, I just have to say... I'll ever draw, so. <laughs> not everyone has to have that spotlight, massive career render. But if it's on the table, take it. Well, you just talk about career enders. How about Matt Hardy killing off Jeff Hardy's dog in the build-up to their match at WrestleMania 25? Matt Hardy turned on his brother Jeff to instigate a very intense and personal rivalry. In the feud, Matt Hardy implied that he was responsible for a number of misfortunes in Jeff Hardy's life, including backstage attacks, a car accident, and a pyro malfunction. Around this time, Jeff Hardy faced a real-life tragedy where there was a fire at his house, where the family home burned down and he lost everything. Most heartbreakingly, Jeff's dog Jack died in the fire. That fucking breaks my heart. That does. Uh, WWE used his real-life tragedy to put heat heat on the fucking that's a terrible use of that word to put heat on the hardy's blood feud the promo on smackdown matt implied he was the one who burned down jeff's house and killed his dog matt hardy has since revealed on his podcast um that that was an event that was so tragic and so sad literally his house burned down all of the old tights all of his old gear were lost in the fire his dog died it was really traumatic uh just for them to put that in our storyline was almost like it was in bad taste i'll never forget them burning a dog collar and then i held the dog collar that's yeah, no, that's getting a big fat no from me. I'm afraid. Yeah, that's a big regret. Obviously, it's real life death of an animal, and that I feel, you know, if if an event like that is really traumatized and happens like so close to the thing, I feel like it's better just to not mention it. I think um, Matt Hardy, as a responsible adult, though, I know that you're saying it's in bad taste and all that, but there must have been some sort of agreement between the two to do it. Yeah, I'm that's like, true. No, like, like you know, I know that people say like, "Oh, Vince McMahon's a monster," and like that is true. But the bottom line is, that these people still have the ability to say no, and you can't say, "Oh, well, he didn't have anywhere else to go" because they kept fucking off back and forth to TNA in that period anyway. Yeah, I think, um, I think it, in my opinion, just hearing the story now and thinking myself, do you, I think it might have been more affected if they'd done it with like Matt. Oh, well, like Jeff's cutting a promo and he's saying like all these tragedies around him and he's like breaking down and then Matt could like console him or something and then right at the end just snaps and just turns on him again I feel like that could have been more effective that would have been much cooler yeah if he was like it's got nothing to do with me but all of your things have made you weak and I can't afford to have you being weak because you're you know I'm stronger than you and that would have actually yeah. been much cooler heel turn so that's a great fucking idea so there you go Cameron Anderson working the creative for CWP going forward <laughs> uh, Mick Foley's This Is Your Life segment with John Cena apparently a big regret obviously riding off the bandwagon of the Raw's most highest rated segment of all time which of course was when Mick Foley did uh, The Rocks This Is Your Life um, on Facebook, Mick Foley said the segment was one of the biggest regrets he had in his entire career. I absolutely knew there was no way in my first appearance on WTV in three years that I should have agreed to be part of This Is Your Life, John Cena. Every bone in my body told me that being part of it was a bad idea, but after three years away, I didn't want to rock the boat. Yeah, I've not seen that one. I've actually, I never heard about that. I didn't know that was a real thing. Like the other ones I have heard of. Yeah, not maybe not necessarily seen, but it wasn't yeah, I had segment. no idea that was a thing. It wasn't a great segment. No, it just felt really cheap, and they've tried to do it again, haven't they, with um Bailey and Bailey. Like, this, and that was fucking appalling. Like, that yeah, was, that really got away. From, I think the actors, yeah, they just got away from them. Yeah, that that was awful. That segment. So yeah, big fat no from me. Um, we'll try and race through these pretty quick. Ric Flair's entire TNA career. Yeah, you're that. <laughs> I'm gonna say nay because we got the incredible promo that was him and Jay Lethal. And that yeah. alone is worth his entire career for me. That's one of my favorite things I've ever seen in wrestling. Yeah, I think um, 
Yeah, they but... regret it, by the way. Obviously, <laughs> well, he did get pants. And it's like <laughs> that kind of is a bit shit in it. Like, what? I know I got wedged by Dirty Dave, but if I'm Ric Flair and I'm just like basically just uh, old. By the way, Dirty shit. Dave wedging fucking people who are like half his age, like grow up. Yeah, isn't it? what's bit, next? Bit, bit, Willie not is being funny, finish. mate, but might be a matter for the police. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, knobs in the mud anyway, so... Knobs? Never <laughs> heard of them. Yeah, exactly. Enjoy your handicaps, hon. Um, <laughs> so, and we, of course, actually, don't say that. Just so we're clear, that's got nothing to do with, like, mocking. Or it's to do with a match coming up, whatever. Um, so, you know what? When you see the cards, you can all fucking, you know, say thank you later. Uh, Baron Corbin <laughs> retiring Kurt Angle. Um, yeah. Do we regret yes. Baron Corbin retiring <laughs> Yeah, John Cena would have been cooler, wouldn't it? Just ties everything together. Yeah, though, Baron Corbin is a big star. Yeah. Is he? Is he? <laughs> I like I like Happy. As I he's now known. One thing, it got loads of heat, and that's the idea, isn't it? That's true. Guy who retired but what's he doing now? Yeah. Oh, Kurt Angle is actually at the Destiny show this weekend in Canada. No, not him. I meant Happy. Oh, Baron Corbin, he's involved in arguably one of the most high-profile rivalries of all time against Pat McAfee. <laughs> I thought you were going to say against Matt Cat Moss then. Oh, um, right. he, he's actually in a Fatal Five way tonight on SmackDown. Winner faces Gunter that he's not going to win. What at uh, Clash of Castle? Clash of Castle. I think Sheamus is going to win. Yeah, fair enough. That, that would be sick, though, wouldn't it? To go fucking stiff as houses and try and kick the shit out of each other. Yeah. Do you know what? We need to upgrade it back. Have you heard, by the way, Clash at the Castle, they have proper downsized the price of tickets on the floor to try and get more people to sit on the floor because they haven't sold as well as they would have liked. All right, I'll get down there then. Even though 2400 was apparently a reasonable amount of money to charge, wasn't it? <laughs> Luna Tricks. Obviously, as you know, Luna I wonder where you got the nickname Pona Tricks from. Oh, yeah. Don't <laughs> So I, I don't get oh, paid for the CW. <laughs> I don't get paid for the CWP shows because no you know Luna Tricks is taking so much out the charity purse to pay for a WWE tickets. The Luna <laughs> Tricks Foundation has been found to be embezzled <laughs> to the tune of twenty four hundred pounds. <laughs> oh, good stuff, good stuff. And anyone saying it's unfair, she's welcome to come back on and argue the point. Um, <laughs> simple as that. Uh, I can't wait till the next time she's on. Fuck you two. You're both cunts. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Uh, Zack Ryder ending the Z True Long Island story, uh, revolutionising social media and all that shit. Him basically giving up on his internet premise. Uh, you okay with that? Yeah, that kind of that kind of sucks though, because that's what really made him stand out, wasn't it? Um, it yeah, they could have easily done it as like a segment or like a dot com segment, something like that. Um, yeah, it doesn't really not great to me. He's still doing the internet shit though. He's still um he's internet champ again, isn't he? Yeah. Digital media champion true. formerly. Yeah. Uh, I know he's hurt at the moment, I but he was care. the uh universal champion as well. Yeah, don't care. Um, <laughs> I just don't care that much. It's just not the GCW much. Universal Championship is funny though. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. GCW, by the way, great to see some people that I've actually shared a locker room with like uh, Joe Lando and Axe. Joe Lando, yeah. Really happy for those guys. Right, the final one before we wrap it up is, believe it or not, Booker T regrets infamously, infamously using a racial slur live on TV. I'm sure you can imagine which one it is. It's from Spring Stampede 97 when he says, Hulk Hogan, we come in for you. Anyone want to complete it in the comments? Do so at your own fucking haste. Um, yeah. Help us out, can we? So... <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that, can yeah, I? That right there is what I'm naming this podcast. Help it, help us out, can we? <laughs> Speaking on his own podcast, the Hall of Famer, uh, Booker T says, I had me. always thought about everything before I would do it. And that one moment, that one moment in time, I don't know. I can't tell you what happened or anything like that, but I slipped. But none of my peers had ever heard me use that word before. And none of them had ever heard me use it after the fact, you know. So I just felt like it was a definitely a moment for me that I wish I could take back. But every time I have the chance to talk about it, I try to use it as an ed educational moment. Um, <laughs> do you regret Hulk Hogan being called an N-word by Booker T? 
I'm going to have to say I don't regret this one. <laughs> Me either. So, you know, I know that I'm of ethnic uh, background, but even I'm not going to fucking dare to wade into that territory. And to be honest, I doubt even any Kenway. Has anyone, by the way, just out of pure curiosity, has anyone ever heard any Kenway drop the end bomb Uh... I I'm curious, like you know, <laughs> I think noob might be the most dangerous M word he's ever used. But yeah. good for him; he's a classy gentleman. Enjoy your retirement, sir. Um, obviously running away from me, the little fucking pussy, old, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> bottom line is, um, and also by the way, notice how he, uh, he didn't have to wrestle you at IWE again. Mm, shady, heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I know what's up. I know what's going on there. I know what's going on. Desperate to protect his No Limits Championship before a real wrestler took it off of him, but it is what it is. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't regret it at all. Hulk Hogan, we are definitely coming for you. Insert M word. Um, <laughs> in fact, me, I'm coming for you, bitch. <laughs> um, simple as that. Fuck Hulk Hogan, man. Honestly, Booker T, what a legend. What a legend. Uh, yeah, I can understand this is a very embarrassing moment for Booker T in particular. Um, but it is iconic in its own way. Um. I and think I'd is... be more stunned if Azzy Adams used the N-word. It's quite funny, I feel. I'm I think I can I can say it's very funny. You know, I I watch like Chappelle, I watch um, you know, Donald Glover and that. It's funny that he that, that happened. Yeah. It wasn't malice, it wasn't a you know, there was no kind of racial tension behind it. It's just simply a thing of like, you know, this is like a bit a bit of his culture, just that maybe you wouldn't want necessarily at the forefront of what you're doing representing a black athlete on screen just came thundering out. Like Yeah, you know. I, I know he's come out and said like no one should be saying it under any circumstances. Yeah. Um I obviously I'm not going to get involved in that debate. No, um, I mean, we're not really in a position <laughs> to say whether you should or shouldn't be using the N-word. I know that a lot yeah. of black people that I've worked with in our business um, have the same opinion. I also know people who believe that it should still be used as a term of endearment to kind of veer away from the negative connotations of what it was used for originally. Um, so, you know, ultimately, that's not my fucking, well, as they say, actually, I'm not going to use that analogy because that will just sound racist, but ultimately, it is not my fucking point of view and it's not my culture to speak from. Um, so exactly. I will defer to the black community and they are happy to educate you further. And if you genuinely want to learn more, there are loads of incredible foundations, actually, that help educate people uh, in the ways of, you know, black communities, black culture, African American, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of stuff out there. So you know, do yourself do yourself a favour and educate yourself a little bit. It's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with understanding your fellow man and woman even more, or however you choose to identify. Uh, that's about it, really. Anything else you want to talk about? Um, Are we killing really. Bruce on the way to Clash at the Castle? We're we just going to like get him out and make him do the mile on the way? Get him yeah, let's do that. That's That Drop sounds great. Drop him service station like somewhere near Oxford and be like, walk, bitch. Yeah. I'm all for that. This Sunday, I believe you're wrestling, aren't you, Cameron Anderson? I am wrestling indeed. And it's going to be a good time. I'm going to be so tired afterwards. You yeah, you're having a cold play this weekend, didn't you? I am. And it's rail strikes. So I think it's going to be a nightmare getting back. Um, I think I can get there. I London, think we right? might have to. Huh? London, right? Yes, Wembley. If. if... If for some reason things are really shit, give me a shout because I am free this weekend. That's all right. I think um I've, uh, I've did, spoken with you. Go. George has actually pulled out. There you go. George pulled out literally last minute and was just like, "Oh, I'm Who actually the working." Fuck, right? How much were tickets for Coldplay? Uh, one hundred and thirty. One hundred and thirty. That's a very big event, and yet they didn't charge you twenty four hundred to be in the biggest stadium in the country. Weird that. Yeah, one of the best venues yeah, in the yeah. world, I would say. What would you say is the best sort of venues? Um, I do love Wembley. Obviously, I'm going there October the 30th because my beloved Denver Broncos are returning. <clears throat> 12 years. I'm so excited. I'm going to get wrecked beyond belief. By the way, if anyone would like to come and join me, it's about 70 or 80 quid for a ticket for a full day's entertainment, including American football, and you can drink in the stands. I'll Maybe. come. 
Let me know. Let me know. We'll sort out a little gaggle of people. It's going to be on Sunday, October the 30th, which luckily for me is one of the only days in October I'm not working. Um, actually, I've just realised because I was going to do BCW that day and they couldn't afford me. And now I've realised happy days because I was going to see American football. I've only just realised that. So you know what? Fuck you, Ebenezer. And fuck your shitty promotion. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I love Kit Knox and I love uh, Ebenezer. Have a great time at BCW. For those of you who will be working Fright Night, I unfortunately will not be there. But um, enjoy the graphics because they're the best because I made them. Uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to come and join me on uh, October 30th for Broncos versus the Jaguars, which, by the way, will have Tony Khan in the house for because he is the executive director of the Jaguars. So if anyone wants to come and stand on the sideline with me and throw untold amounts of abuse at the AEW Virgin, let us know. Um, I'm going to bring my gear. May I actually... Can we actually try and get a book? <laughs> should, <laughs> should we just Please. Like, oh, stand, I'm going to bring like orange-themed Egyptian death machine gear. My tights are orange anyway. So I'll be like, I'm supporting the Broncos, but I'm also here for a booking. I want to go on AEW Dark and I want to wrestle uh, Aaron Cruz on AEW Dark. That's what I want to do. I want to kill him in a yeah. two-minute squash. Surely they're going to get Joe Lando on there in the next year. Yeah, I think Surely. so. I think so. Yeah, he'll probably yeah, be those... jobbing out to Luther in about three minutes, knowing our luck. <laughs> oh, no. No. <laughs> yeah, by the way, can we have Speedball Mike Bailey versus Joe Lando immediately, please? Oh, by the way, Joe Lando... Yeah. Um, that was meant to happen. Speedball Mike Bailey is wrestling Will Ospreay tomorrow in Red Pro. Yes, yeah, it's the, um, seen it anniversary show. Live. I actually went to see it live years ago. Um, but yeah, fuck me. Is that going to be a worldie for RevPro? Absolutely. Yeah, so 10 years of RevPro. That is pretty cool, actually. Yeah, RevPro obviously uh, founded off the back of FWA in 2012. So congratulations to everyone involved. Like, um, Very, very cool. Um, I know people have personal opinions on RevPro, but the quality of wrestling has never been in doubt. Some of the best wrestling in Europe, if not the world. Well, I, I know you've attended quite a few of their events. What would you say is your most iconic Rev Pro moment? I got to be in the front row for Tomohiro Ishii versus Minoru Suzuki in the main event for the title. That was pretty special. I got to see Ishii versus Keith Lee. Um, Chris Hero versus Katsuyura Shibata. Um, that was fucking naughty. I got to see Chris Hero versus... I've noticed Tomohiro Ishii's cropping up quite a lot because he's one of my favourite wrestlers. Um, one of my favourite moments, actually, is a really random one. It was a fail four way tag team championship match if i remember rightly aussie open cck uh dan mcgee and rob lias i think and um the legion of lords and it was during that period where rishi was out with injury so gideon gray was coming out with a an inflatable with a balloon on its head painted like rishi <laughs> um, and I think one. I think Chris Brooks or one of Aussie, Aussie, Aussie Open accidentally pops the balloon, and Lord Gideon Gray goes fucking berserker, <laughs> and it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. He's like, "Stop touching Brooks's hand!" He's like freaking out, and it's actually really funny. It's probably on Red Pro on demand somewhere. It's one of the early mm-hmm. live at the cockpits. Uh, I got to see so many matches that I didn't think I would at Red Pro. Like I got to see Dave Mastiff versus Tyler Bate just randomly on a cockpit, and then they obviously run it back years later at NXT UK and I mean that's pretty cool um I got to see obviously Speedball versus Will Ospreay I got to see Will Ospreay versus Mighty Skull I know it's not a popular name now but those matches were incredible Mighty Skull versus Chris Hero I saw live I was there for Vader versus Ospreay I was right in front that's of what I was gonna say that is like iconic to me like it that's blows my mind cool. that that happened like that is an insane feud that's an insane match to have happened and it yeah, happened I, um incredible. like the on our doorstep Vader wrestle like, that's so random. Yeah, that <laughs> is special, man. And I I am envious. And yeah, I that's be for the cool. rest of my life. Front row, Zach Sabre Jr. versus Kurt Angle. That was very cool. Um, I got to see quite do you know what was really weird was the matches that you would think would be main events now that you didn't really think as much of then. I saw Pete Dunn versus Penta at Portsmouth Guild Hall. Like, and that now, if you're like, oh, yeah, fucking I have some of that. And at the time, everyone was like, yeah, that sounds right. There's some geezer in a mask. <laughs> and, like, and I'm like, <laughs> I obviously just been quite big in, um, uh, is it Lucha Underground? And uh, I was just sitting there thinking, what, this is going to be fucking, and it was. They fucking kicked the shite out of each other. And it was one of the last uh, shows, I believe, that Pete Dunne did before he left for uh, mainstream television. So, yeah, no, that was really sick. Uh, yeah, yeah honestly, and I've got some friends coming through there now, actually. So obviously, uh, right, Samuel yeah. Hawks, Cameron Kai—they've uh, debuted as a tag team against the Velocities, I think. 
that's the last week or the week before. The next generation, man. You know, that's, you guys. Have... I mean, yeah, I thought it was a really big deal for them. It's uh, great for the school as well. They've got uh, Maya Matthews from the school. Uh, who's doing some amazing work. She's just debuted in her purpose as well, and she's facing her Chantal Jordan. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, it just seems to be going up and up, in my opinion. I know what you like about Rev Pro, uh, and I've been critical of certain things that they do, but the one thing I will say is that they are some of the best wrestling to be had, and they train you to wrestle better than anyone else, I think. They really do. Yeah. Um, the quality can't be denied. And look at the guys that we know, you know, the Tate Mayfairs of the world, Dave Francisco's, Michael Oku's, like, these are all the best wrestlers in the world, in my opinion, and they all work through there, and they all train through there. So, yeah. you know. Obviously, I'm going to be biased, because I do train there, but, like, at the same time, they did put me in the ring training with people Mike Bailey. Like, that's special, yeah. man. Yeah, when I was there, like I, you know, I, I had the chance to sort of be around the same ilk of people like Great Okan and Lord Gideon Gray and Rishi and uh, Dan McGee, Rob Lias, Jay, you know, uh, obviously uh, Jason Joshua, I think his name is uh, James, 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 James Joshua. My apologies. It's been a long while. Um, <laughs> you know, like loads of different talents, like so many. Um, Joshua James is who I think. I'm sorry. And yeah. um yeah, it, like the amount of talent and some people might argue, oh, those are more low end. But to me, they were like the best workhorse wrestlers. Curtis Chapman, being able to learn from him was awesome. You know, and then you see the guys who are coming through, like Harry Milligan. He's fantastic. Super Kurt. Obviously, Curtis Chapman is now um, Mad Kurt, which is fucking awesome. Uh, they're just doing so many great things. It's really cool to see that the guys who don't necessarily make it in Red Pro still end up going to great places and doing amazing things elsewhere because of the quality of the training. So it's not a waste of time to go there, even if you, you know, don't make it for whatever reason or don't get to wrestle Okada, which is the dream. You know, I have great memories of Kenneth Halfpenny and Sean Jackson and the team were fantastic. Two really special talents. We got to work with Sean Jackson recently, myself at IWE. Lovely guy, really stand-up guy. Like there's actually yeah, he's a lot great. of really yeah no he's really cool Sean Jackson he's a great worker and he's also a really likable lovely guy really top end same as um Kenneth Halfpenny had a lot yeah. of time for him he took interest in me when I was training him more so than other people would so do you know what Rev Pro there's been some bad stuff obviously and people know about that it was mostly in the news but the bottom line is they've actually provided a lot of what you see now in the wrestling landscape and they were one of the first people to make Will Ospreay a star when everyone else was like it's just some flippy guy and now look at him fucking mega star so, yeah, it's pretty good shit. Yeah, he um, yeah, he's never forgot that, has he? And he came back. Nah, he still. That's why he keeps coming back. He always said, like, you know, as long as I live, Rev Pro will always have me available and stuff. And also, by the way, Pack getting a run out there as well and having amazing matches. Using yeah, the, he um, had a match with um Connor Mills recently for the AEW yeah. belt. Yeah, and uh, LJ Cleary, former guest on this podcast. You know, like it's very cool, actually. Red Pro, Red Pro has been uh, intrinsically linked in a lot of what we've done here, which is very cool. So, yeah, no, congratulations. Like, well-deserved 10 years and hopefully 10 more years and more so after that. Very, very you've cool. You've got to think with, um, you know, there being a lot more free agents in the scene, there's going to be a lot more people coming through those doors in the future. Yeah, yeah. You've got to think guys like Charles Samuels are going to come back into the fold again. Oh, for sure. Most of the NXT UK talent will have found a home in Red Pro at some point or another before they got there. So it, you've got to think that they're going to be coming back. Same with progress as well. You know, the um, to be honest, I feel like British wrestling is starting to get back to that boom that we wanted it to. It's not quite the mm. golden era, you know, the Pete Dunn, the Osprey, like there's so many names there. But it does feel like it's really built a nice home for itself again. And it feels like it is on the up. It does. It's cool yeah, Charles Samuels for me. Charles Samuels for me, definitely like an iconic sort of Rev Pro yeah. talent. Yeah. Yeah. His promo skills were just lights out as well. Like just so good. I remember the crowd chanting who are fat Cantonara at him and all this kind of stuff. Like, you know, and he just took it in his stride. He was so good at being a bell end. Brilliant. You know, I still haven't forgotten about him. Um, you know, I think it was, uh, I think it might have been Shah versus, or it might have been Rob Lyles. They wrestled um, Devon Dudley, no, not Devon, um, Buddy Ray Dudley at a show at Red Pro once, just randomly. I think Rob Lyles ended up going through the table. I think it was Shah Samuels versus Buddy Ray. And it's just it's weird matches like that. And you think, yeah, they, they, <laughs> there's always been something there with Red Pro and always will be. It's, I've, I've got to see some of the all time great matchups, got to see Volta, by the way, wrestle. 
regularly thanks to them. Oh yeah, I forgot I saw Big Damo versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Not bad. Not that's bad. Pretty, that's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> Not bad, Progress is it? Champ. In the mid card. Big Damo. Well. Right, yeah. I got to see Carla Riley versus um I forgot his name now, the really, really good um Kushida, that's it. I saw Kushida versus Carla Riley there. That's that's see, pretty big. Got to see the Briscoes versus the Young Bucks, got to see the Elite versus uh Leo Rush, Ryan Smile and Shane Strickland, I believe it was, which was who's now obviously Swerve. Um yeah, just fucking just amazing moments, really is. We could spend all day talking about it, but we haven't got all day. Uh, anything else we want to talk about, mate? Um, I don't know. I think we kind of hit a lot of stuff. We've mentioned all the important news that's coming Actually, out. One of the most sensible ones we've done for a while. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just get riled up when other people are here. You know, I've got a show. Yeah. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Dan Beer and Luna Tricks are the unprofessional people. Yeah, this is a very smooth process. I'm just saying. By the way, Carl Wilkinson, rest in peace, man. Um, <laughs> I think he's yeah. been gone from WrestleBlog long enough that we can declare him legally dead. So yeah. uh yeah, have a Kyle. One. Yeah. Kyle, once you get a shag, ah, you're welcome friend. back on the pod. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once you get I cannot believe you dropped that in the group chat. Got a shag yet, mate. I was like, oh my lord. Um, just just so we're clear, I have, so you ain't got no excuse. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I, um... Break it down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> suck it. <laughs> they did indeed. Um, anyway, um, all hilarity aside, and all truthful jokes aside, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure, Cameron Anderson. Uh, if anyone would you like to tell anyone where you're wrestling on Sunday, or would you like to keep it a secret for the sake of your oh, I'm wrestling for Premier in Rustington, and yeah, it's going to be a pretty special card. They always are with Premier. I think it's it's such a cool promotion to be a part of now. Um, I'm starting to do a little bit more with them every time um, because I feel like that it's such, I don't know. I feel like um, I've had premier on my doorstep for so many years and you just go there. It's just seeing the poster. You're not really sure who's going to be on that. And it's just a sleeper every single time. Yeah. Yeah, it's very old school, and I imagine some people would say it'd be nice to bring it into the modern era with videography and I, stuff like that. I don't know. But I like the fact that it's kind of an unknown, that it's traditional, you know? But I know that's yeah. spite in myself, because I'd love to work for a company like that, especially being uh, afforded the opportunity to work with you and see you more, but I'm one of those people where I'm like, I kind of like the mystique of the old values. And I think what John does there is very cool. And obviously the wrestlers they use are really high end, high quality wrestlers. So I think it actually speaks volumes about how well you're doing and how good you are that you're able to work for them because they're not going to just employ anyone, (laughs) but you've got to be good at what you do. So uh, do you know who your opponent is yet? I cannot confirm just yet. That's fine. Well, if you do want to check it out, it's this Sunday, I believe, Rustington, which is near Ang Maroon, uh, which is somewhere near Brighton, I think. Uh, somewhere around yeah, that Yes, it's, it? it's on the same train line. Yeah. It's more close you to shore. train there from Brighton, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for anyone yeah. thinking, oh, we'll travel, but there are train strikes this weekend, so obviously check before you leave or whatever. But if you are somewhat local or can even drive there, check it out. It should be fucking awesome. Um, I'm free, just saying. So you might get to see my fat, ugly mug there. So that'll be something to do. Um, but yeah, no, it should be awesome. Whoever you're wrestling, God forbid they go over because they will get heat from me, but have a great time. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy. Oh, I let that happen. Nah. <laughs> Death. <laughs> Death by Hammerlock is all I have to say about that. <laughs> Give them that meat. Seriously, they're like the wrist lock from Death. And then if needs yeah, be, I'll get in there and give them the shit. drop toe hold from Death, mate. I'm, I'm ready for it. Right, the drop toe hold needs to be the finishing move to end all finishing moves. But yeah, have a great time wrestling this weekend, mate. Enjoy Coldplay. Uh, oh, thank you very much for joining us at the Wrestle Plug, brothers. Yeah, awesome. thanks for having us on again. My pleasure, mate. Ladies and gentlemen, obviously, don't forget to check out at Cameron1PW on all his social media to follow on and see what he's doing. And also just have a look at some of them sexy bromance pictures because there's going to be some naughty graphics dropping soon as well. Oh, so, yes. Uh, yeah. oh yes, we look after our boys here at the rest of the vlog. Don't forget, we're also the home of BCW now in terms of the footage. So if you missed out on BCW Reload, including this one here who um, wrestled in Anarchy Rules against Brandon Lee and the virus came Michael. You can check that out. That will be uploaded on the YouTube channel over this weekend. So make sure... Yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing that with everyone because that was a really fun match. 
yeah, it's one of your best matches so far. And obviously you're so early on and so young in your career, but already having great high quality matches and that triple threat is absolutely worthy of standing on its own against two wonderful wrestlers in the Boris K. Michael and Brandon Lee. And all the other footage, of course, available from BCW. Not to mention, uh, you might get lucky and you might see more footage on the channel going forward. So lots of stuff to come from WrestleBlog, lots of stuff to come from me, Aaron Nix Design, if you want to get in contact with me for any reason, send me more hate mail, because love that stuff. Um, whatever, <laughs> whatever you say, Dennis, whatever you say. Um, <laughs> that's an inside joke that nobody will get except for me, because I'm the one being abused by him. But yeah, bottom line is, thank you very much, whether you like me or you hate me. I don't really care. I appreciate the fact that you take the time to listen and watch. I, um, so, yeah, I've been Aaron X. He's been Cameron Anderson. And we'll catch you very soon for more content for the WrestlePlug. Mad love to everyone, except for Carl Wilkinson. Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's dead. He's on the side of a milk gun. It's fine.